imagine leaving your loved ones, your home and life as you know it to embark on a one-way mission to Mars? Well, it sounds like a very far-fetched plot from a science fiction film, but believe it or not, it could actually be a reality for our next guests. Claire Whedon and Ryan MacDonald, and welcome both of you. Thank you. Why? <laughs> Well, it, for me, principally, it's about inspiring people. It's about showing a new generation that if they pursue science, and in particular that if they continue and are determined enough to push something to the limit, then anything is possible, just like that generation that was inspired by the Apollo landings. Well, this is a group of, of people who've been sort of whittled down. Uh, m many, many applicants uh, have, uh, have applied for this particular challenge. Uh, and you, then you're in the sort of final group that have been selected. Uh, the, 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 I suppose the one thing that everyone thinks about here is, the, is that it is one way. Uh, if it succeeds and you live to, to make the journey, uh, then you will never come back. Um, uh, some people have said it's, the, it, it, it's pioneering space mission essential with the continuation of mankind. Others have called it a suicide mission. What are your thoughts? Well, it's, um, it's always going to be one way because that's what we want to do. We want to colonise Mars. We want to go to live there. We want to, uh, you know, do research um, on the planet. We want to see if we can find any living biology. Um, and that's the whole point of it. Why would you want to go just to come back again? We want to colonise Mars. We want to really get that through to everybody. That's what, what the aim of the game is here. Yeah, but what we're doing is we're skipping the whole plant a flag and then come back with a couple rocks phase and going <laughs> straight to the colonisation phase because it's cheaper and that way you achieve so much more. But it's a big, old, red, inhospitable rock. I mean, it's not as if you've got anything particularly to look at. Uh, there's no uh, visible water there. Um, you can't go out for a walk. Uh, what, what, what will you do for the rest of your lives? Sure, well, there's lots of misconceptions about Mars, Rampol. Although you say there's no visible water, we know from landings such as the Phoenix mission in 2007, there's water just six centimetres beneath the surface in the polar regions. In fact, there's enough water on Mars to cover the entire planet up to about seven metres if you were to melt it all. So we know that Mars used to be a habitable planet about four billion years ago, thanks to missions such as Curiosity. And the big question for wanting to send humans there is, can we make it a habitable planet again one day? So the idea is that you go, it's 10 years away, 2024. 20, um, or 20, yes, exactly. And you, between now and then, you've got to decide who's going to go, because that, this number is going to be whittled down again. Because yeah. these are the only people you will ever spend the rest of your mm -hmm. lives with, the only people you will have contact with in the flesh. How does that process now work, and what do you do for the next 10 years to prepare yourself for this potential journey? Yeah, sure. So at the moment, where there is 100 people left in the world, and that's going to be whittled down to 24 by the end of this year who will go into full-time astronaut training in six groups of four people. Now, there will be future selection processes opening up about once every two years to replenish anyone who drops out for whatever reason. And eventually, people are going to go to Mars, so you need to get more people training for it. So you will be with that group of four people on Mars, but every two years, four more people will arrive to build up a real community. So you're, you're not just with the same people for the entire rest of your but life. But you are for a couple of years, certainly, for that first bit until well, the next four come. Certainly, but you've trained with that group of four people for up to ten years beforehand, so you're already intimately familiar with them before you even go to Mars. So what's two more years? It's a lot, really, to be honest, <laughs> uh, and considering it's not that many when they all arrive anyway. <laughs> do, do you not worry about that in itself, never mind everything else? No, not particularly, because we have the advantage that during the training we have to spend about three months every year in a simulation habitat, basically a replica of the Mars base here on Earth with those same four people. So we're already very familiar with them, with the systems, so, and the idea is actually they make the simulation so harsh that we'll find Mars a paradise in comparison. This is, um, this is a Dutch non-profit organisation hoping to, to use existing technology to carry out the mission. The projects are funded by a reality TV show which will document the mission. Um, also expecting and hoping for funding from universities and businesses. Now, I love a bit of reality telly, but I wouldn't let it send me into space. I'm not sure I'd trust the technology. So all the t this is all based on existing te technology and science. Um, there's a lot of steps to go yet. We've got to do, and um, they're planning on doing eight unmanned missions before planning on sending us out. You know, the reality TV is to get everybody involved. You think about when um, humans first went to the moon, yeah? Everybody was watching. Everybody will be interested in this and everybody will want to watch. But, That's well, there what the was TV a plan on bringing them back, though, wasn't there? <laughs> that was the ultimate plan. 
There was, but to to get us there in um, you know in the foreseeable future, it's got to be one way. It, hmm. The the cost and the weight of the fuel, etc. It's just not you know it's just not um, realistic. So the idea is to go get footprint on Mars, do research, do science, and hopefully you know make a difference for the future. Hmm. What what made you? It hit this short list. You're obviously not a science person because no. you just said you're going to go out there and do science. So, <laughs> so <laughs> science may be not necessarily your strong point. So how did you how did you get through? How were you selected? Um, so my background is systems integration. Um, the, the Mars One Committee were very clear on the application. You did not have to have any specific skills. You had to show that you, you know, you're intelligent, you're diverse, you can learn well, you can work in a team, you can lead. I feel that I demonstrate all those skills, and I think that's really what's got me here today. Um, right, a study at MIT found that should mm -hmm. the first explorer succeed in landing using current technology and no resources, they would survive for just 68 <laughs> days before they suffocated. Researchers from the University of Kansas have also warned that high levels of radiation in space damage the ovaries and the testicles, which could hamper people's efforts to reproduce. And you, it, for this to succeed, I'm assuming, if you're going to build a colony, then you guys have got to do the business. What, what happens uh, if, it, if it radiates your nads? Well, this is point of it. In fact, we know exactly what we're going to do. So the astronaut career allowance that you're allowed to get for radiation is around 1,000 millisieverts. We know from the measurements on a radiometer aboard the Curiosity mission will be exposed to around 360 millisieverts on the way to Mars. Now, we're going to attach all of our seven months of the water supply to get to Mars on the outside of the ship to provide shielding. And once we're on Mars, we're going to have five metres of Martian soil covering the inflatable habitats to provide the same level of protection we get from the Earth's atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So we know what we're doing with radiation. And the key thing you mentioned about the MIT study, that's if you don't use any local resources. Of course, if you don't produce any more nitrogen or oxygen, you're going to run out. We will be. We're going to be taking nitrogen from the Martian atmosphere, water from beneath the soil. And in fact, the same MIT study shows that if you do use local resources, there's no problems for the first thing. You're going to breed. Days. You'll breed up there, yeah? Um, that's the, that's the it's plan? Not, it's not in the plan for the first few years. Mm. The, the science, uh, the research is behind it in how, you know, a fetus will grow. Um, there's only 38% gravity on Mars to, compared to Earth. Um, and so your bone and muscle density will, will change. And that, that's going to be one thing that we're going to be mm. uh, researching, is to, to find out how our bodies have adapted and whether we're able to. So definitely mm. not for the first few years. It's, There'll be no reproduction. It's just too risky. If you only have four people, you can't afford to lose someone in charge. Birth. It's yeah. just way too risky. What do your family and your friends make of this monumentally huge decision? Also, in, in my case, generally my family is quite supportive because I've never made I've wanted to go into space ever since I've been really young. It's been a lifelong dream for me. But of course, um, particularly like my little sister, she doesn't want me to go on a personal level because we're really close and always have been. But so long as obviously I can stay in contact, I can communicate with my family via mm. video messages with about a 40 minute delay each You can't way. put your arm around them again. You've no, chosen not I've, to be able to give your sister a hug ever again. That, that's true, and that's part of the reason why my sister doesn't want me to go, but um, I've spoken to her about it, and she, she shows that she doesn't want to stand in the way of my own personal dream. Yeah. What about your family? Um, same, they're, they're really supportive. You know, there's mixed, there's mixed feelings. There's some um, real kind of apprehension now that um, I'm getting closer and closer. Um, you know, there's, there's a feeling of I don't want you to go, but when they know this is really what I want to do and this is my focus, then of course, they're my family. They're going to stand behind me. Well, we wish you both the very best of luck. <laughs> Kyle says this is a great idea. People call Columbus an idiot when he said the world was round. So uh, yeah. thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much. Good luck. It's ten years away, so, so I'm sure we'll hear more about yeah. you.